نعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. We start by praising Allah. Furthermore, we ask Allah to bestow the peace and blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and indeed all of those who follow in his righteous footsteps until the day of judgment is established and none has knowledge of that day amongst the created things, the created human beings but Allah. So today we need to address the topic and I say we, it's the royal we, okay? We need to address the topic of patience, persistence, and indeed the final examination. Because for 10 years I struggled uh, before I became an academic, and then as an academic I struggled to find from within and externally and externally uh, some sort of a, a moral path, a truth that would allow me to understand exactly what the, the whole of this existence was all about. So I struggled and I strived and I had persistence. I had great persistence in this. To ask why? Simply because if you can't have persistence in the task of finding out what you're doing in this planet, you can't have persistence in anything. You can't have patience upon anything until you know what you've been created for. So, we as well, we Muslims, Muslims, Muslim, the term fundamentally means to give over your free will or deny your um, innermost lust and desires to that of one. God. The term actually comes from Islam, which means to submit to the will of one God. A God in Islam is or the God or God or Allah is very much a creator that cannot be added to or subtracted from. He cannot be in his creation. He isn't external to his creation, although he created everything, and he knows in one verse of the Quran it mentions that he's closer to the human being than that they are to their own jugular vein. So he knows the aspirations of the human being more than the human being knows himself. So, we understand from Islam, the Islamic understanding of God, when God says something goes, we demonstrate our Islam, we become Mu Islam. We do the verb Mu Islam. We do Islam, we do submission. We're the submitters. This means that we cannot make the ground rules up ourselves. If we have a set of rules, we have a set of values, we cannot change those values to suit the needs of a group of people or a group of people within the believers, for example. Some of the Muslims want to pull us this way sometimes. Some of them want to pull us back that way. We have fundamental principles and we cannot change them. And it's not our fault. You can't blame us for that. It's written in a book which is, was revealed over 1400 years ago to an illiterate man who never left the desert. 
and that book has not changed in its original Arabic script in all that time. It's memorized by millions of people, some of the age of seven and eight years of age. So we have a particular problem as Muslims. Because if we wanted to change it, it would be very difficult to do so. Because we have so many of these people who memorize and say, hey, you're going to change the words of that? I'm sorry, you can't do that. It's not possible. So we have to be patient upon the scriptures. We have to be patient upon what we term as the traditions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him and all of the beloved messengers. And we have to be assuredly concerned that if we make the mistake of trying to, to change, that, that we will certainly fail. We will certainly fail. Scripture is scripture. When I was studying Christianity and I was studying Judaism and I was studying Buddhism, I realized there was an element within all of these other faiths which were possible to change, to fit in with the needs and the desires and the fantasies and the persuasions of different groups within society. But surely, religion is all about giving a moral barometer. So, as we are, you know, say that we are faithful, you know, we cannot make things up as we go along. You know, this is, this is fundamental that we understand this, particularly as the background for me coming here was some blogs, which I'm quite used to by now, okay? You know, stating that I'm this and I'm that, and I'm radical, <laughs> you know, and I'm a bit, you know, probably a terrorist as well, you know, I <laughs> say, you know. I mean, it's fundamental that we address those issues. And we address them with wisdom and carefulness, and we don't want to upset people. I, don't, I know you probably don't want to upset me, and you probably want to know who is the real Yusuf Chambers, you know. Sometimes I want to know who is the real Yusuf Chambers as well when I keep reading blogs and stuff like that, you know. But uh, fundamentally, the real challenge for all of us, regardless of who I am, okay, is it's about what is indeed this existence all about. What is it all about? Now, we, may, we Muslims believe that this world is a test. Indeed, the Christians believe the world is a test. And the Jews, they believe the world is a test. And most of the other faith groups, they believe in some shape or form, this world is a test. So, we believe that we struggle and we strive against following our evil desires. And the barometer for knowing whether or not you have erred is the moral barometer, is the Qur'an and the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, the teachings of all the other prophets that came before him, including Adam, the first man, Moses, Musa, Abraham, Noah, John the Baptist, David, all of the other prophets which are mentioned 25 in the Qur'an. And we use these as a moral barometer. Now, as Muslims, because we have this moral guideline in the shape of a, a book which we, we're not able to revise, not able to change, we believe it is the, actually the word of the one eternal blessed creator, Allah. So, our challenge really, therefore, is to remain faithful to those bodies of work of Qur'an and the 
prophetic traditions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Now, for example, if you haven't got, like for so many years, I didn't have that guiding light in my life. I didn't have those books. I didn't have those scriptures. I would go about the world and do anything I wanted. Nothing, there were no holes barred. Except what my heart and my brain told me not to do because it was going to lead me to danger. You see? So I would go around and we would experiment with human lives, with emotions, with alcohol, with drugs. Indeed, we would uh, do anything, really, because we didn't have that moral guidance in our life. But essentially, something always pulled me back. That thing is known in the Arabic uh, word as fitra, the thing which stops you from erring or from jumping over the cliff every time. You know, you just think, well, I've had my joy, but I'm not going to jump over because it's going to hurt, right? So, every single human being, we believe, is born in this state of being in touch, in some shape or form, with this natural disposition to knowing who God is, knowing really what our lives are all about, and it manifests itself sometimes when we're sick. When we're close to sick, sickness or death, when some of our loved ones are about to perish, when we are in the hospitals or we're riding, as Allah says in the Quran, and the most beautiful, you know, solemnitude, if you like, of this is that you, when you are riding in on the waves on a ship and the sea is calm, you forget me. But then when I bring unto that vessel a storm and you are in difficulty, you start to call upon me. And again, when the return of the calm occurs, you again, it is like you never called upon me. You see, so this is the nature of human beings. We've heard of many an example of A situation when people are in grave danger as a group of people and they call unto God as they're in the throes of trying to escape that danger. The moment the danger disappears, then they forget. The jobs of well, the job of the prophets, the prophets of some magnitude that we understand from one of the hadiths of 124,000 have been sent since the beginning of mankind, or more, was to indeed shape the person and remind them of the fitrah. So I'm explaining Islam to you. And I'm explaining why we have to follow these, this set of rules. And in fact, if we're going to be honest, you know, we have to, we have to follow the Quran and the Sunnah. Because it's the only unchanged work of religion or any other you know major a, a body of work which has been remained unchanged for such a long time 1400 years okay which was revealed to a man that was not of letters he could not he could not read or write he was known as the Aramin. he was known as the trustworthy by his enemies and one narration goes that when he received the first revelation, and after a time he was told, first revelation was Ikra. Ikra bismi rabbi kalladi khalaqa. Read in the name of your Lord who created you. So the next verse, which is some months or years, according to some scholars, is, 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 is to arise and warn. So you read, you've read, you've understood, and now you arise and you walk. And this is the job of the prophets. And this is the job of all the Muslims as well. 
And indeed, you find the Christians are doing this, and the Jews are doing this, but mostly the Christians are doing this to great effect all around the world. They're calling people away from the deception of this world to what they say is their deity. And we Muslims are supposed to do the same thing, although you don't find many of them doing it. Right? It's a failing of the Muslims who've been here for 120 years. The first mosque was established in 1889 by Henry William Abdullah Quilliam. He was a very successful lawyer, a revert like myself to the faith of Islam, who lived in Liverpool when Liverpool was number two in the empire, number two city, you know. And when he opened up this center, the first thing he does is he follows the Sunnah, he follows the traditions of the Prophet Muhammad. What does he do? He opens up the mosque, the house of Allah on Christmas Day. Christmas Day, he invites 1,000 poor children into the mosque and he feeds them. This is Islam. On the second and the third day, he notices that a lot of these children are orphans. At the time, what is the definition of an orphan? In Islam is either one or two of the parents are not there in order to look after the child. So he's an orphan. So he recognizes these orphans and we know that the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam said that you will be like me, like this, in the Akhirah, in the hereafter, like this, if you support <coughs> in this world. So he got hold of all these orphans, he opened up something called the Medina House Orphanage, and he put them in there, he looks after them, on his own volition, on his own back. Because of what? Because he'd been told about Islam, he'd been told about the Prophet Muhammad, and the way of the Prophet Muhammad. You see, sallallahu alayhi wa So this is essentially how Islam started in Britain. Now if you look some 50 years later, you know, and the, by the way he apparently according to Ron uh, Greaves, his biographer, the, the man's biographer, he said that uh, he had something between 600 to 700 people that had embraced Islam by his hands. Because they were convinced that it was indeed the Quran was the last testament to mankind. They were convinced that the Muhammad was indeed a prophet to the worlds. So if you look then, you, you wind the clock forward and you see a period of in the, the 50s after the Second World War you know, all the Indian Muslims start to come in. Some of them are here, right? The forefathers came in. Uh, Pakistanis, of course, Indians, Bengalis, all of these people started to come in as cheap labor, along with, of course, the West Indians that came in as well. And they started to establish mosques in this country. Now, what they did, essentially, was they followed the model, they took the model of their center not from Islam. Reality is they, they, they didn't follow Islam. And this is evidence, because there's a juxtaposition between this Abdullah Quilliam, who's a British white guy who understands the needs and the aspirations of British people in Victorian Britain, and these people that have arrived on the doorstep from village India, back down to Bolton, Bradford, wherever it was, Lancashire, that they arrived here. York, probably. Okay? So these people, when they opened their centers, they didn't feed the poor. They fed themselves. Right? They didn't look after the orphans. They didn't even know what an orphan was. They, on the other hand, were thinking, that maybe we should have some economic success. They came here to attain some sort of economic footing in this country. Now that's not the case of every single person that came. We don't want to tar everyone with the same brush, like it happens to us in the Western media. Muslims, it happens to us every time. But we deserve it in many respects as well. Because we don't open up. 
We don't talk. We don't have open dialogue like we're going to have today, inshallah. We, rather we shy away from engagement in pursuit of our own isolationist policy. So you have 2,000 mosques in this country, plus you have 200 you know, Islamic schools. And it's growing. It's growing by the day. We have Somali communities. I don't see many Somalians here, right? We have the new incumbent Somali community that literally in haze. You know, you know this is why I, I, I see from both angles, you see. Because I am white and I'm middle class and I'm British. But at the same time, I have this love for this book and this man. So I see, you know, in haze. About two to three years ago, there were 2,000 Somalis. Do you know how many there are today? 22,000. Grown exponential. So you have to look at the people, the indigenous people of this country, and they think, well, they're coming in, and they're taking over. And they don't invite us, they don't talk to us, they don't engage with us, and this is the problem. This is fundamentally the problem. And this is why a whole swathe of people will write articles about people that they don't even know. That they've never met. It's not their fault and it's not really our fault. It's us together. We need to engage. This is surely what British society is all about. This is what we love about Britain. That we're able to come in, practice our faith, share our values, hopefully they accept our values as being something, and we take on board what they're saying, not necessarily everything. Because you know, whatever the Qur'an speaks against, we have to be against. Okay? But there are extenuating circumstances. So if you're in Britain, it's not an Islamic state here, right? Last time I looked, I didn't see any rules in number 10. <laughs> right. As far as I'm concerned, this is a democratic society. First past the post-political system. And Dawood Kamran ain't taking shahadi yet. You know who he is? David Kamran. <laughs> but you know, maybe one day we can convince the people. We can convince the people that the last testament to mankind it's worth another look. But until then, there's no killings, no chopping of the hands, no stoning, nothing. It's not going to go on. So I don't understand quite why we can't just talk and just be humans and talk together. I really, really, I... I, I glasnos. Back in the 90s we were talking about glasnos, you know? Who's that guy, Lech Wałęsa, you know, the guy in the Polish shipyard? You know, this is, this is openness and transparency. We should be transparent wherever possible. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace and blessings be upon him, this is what it means. Uh, he said, in one beautiful hadith, he said, None of you have truly believed until you love for others as you love for yourself. And in the shah of this hadith, by the way, so some good brothers come to me and say, ah, it's only Muslims. <laughs> He's wrong. Because the classical scholars actually, they declare that this means insaniyat. Insa. It means that mankind is categorized by this hadith, not Muslims. So we have to see where we are and where we're at and what circumstances we've got around us. So, we Muslims have therefore perhaps the biggest test and we have to have more patience than everyone else put together. Because the final test will be, did you help those people to understand Islam or did you stand by on the sidelines and ignore their needs? Did you tell them about the last testament to mankind? Did you tell them about this man who was known as Al-Amin, the trustworthy by his enemies? 
Did you tell them that when he first gave that account of Islam on Mount Sufa and all of the Quraysh tribes, all of the warring factions and tribes were there, he said, if I was to tell you there was an enemy and it was coming over the mountain and just over there they were coming to destroy you, would you believe me? They said, yes, O oh Muhammad. Muhammad, Ibn Abdullah, the son of Abdullah, you are known as the trustworthy. There's no more trustworthy than you. He told them guarantee of goodness, the guarantee of khair and goodness is not up to me. It's, not, it's up to the one that created us and put us here. The struggle is a unique struggle. The struggle of the Muslim indeed is a unique struggle. It's one that is not for the faint-hearted. Sometimes I can't handle it myself. I see some people, they're falling by the wayside every day, you know. Oh, perhaps I should take my hijab off and appease those people that don't like my hijab. Oh, perhaps I shouldn't pray in public, it looks very not so... Hush, hush, keep it hush, hush, eh? Don't, oh, shall I call myself Mo instead of Muhammad? Or maybe I'll appease this group and allow this group. No. We don't do that, right? But we don't do the antithesis of that and become extreme. We don't become extreme. The descriptions of the best of mankind is known as the one who is, resides between the two extremes. The one, he's umma wa satiya. He's not the hot and he's not the cold. He's not Iceland and he's not Saudi Arabia. <laughs> right? He's somewhere in the middle, which is probably England. Well, I don't know, actually. England's getting a bit too cold for that, you know. But, you know, he's somewhere in the middle. He resides somewhere in the middle. And that's why he's known as, you know, a person who's balanced. He's normal, you know. So we, we strive within the Muslim community, and I'm telling you, we have crazy nutters going around saying, kill them, you know. And then we've got other people who say, don't pray, you know. <laughs> well, somewhere the truth is in between these two, right? You see? So we, we strive and we struggle and we have to have persistence upon just being a person who... And we do this for the sake of God, right? We do this for the sake of God. We don't do it for ourselves or to appease people or to, to look good in front of another group of Muslims, right? <laughs> Which is a problem. We do it because we love God. And a man came to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was a Bedouin. And he said, when will the hour be established? He said, when will the day of judgment be established? By the way, there's a day of judgment, right? According to Islam. This is the test. This is the final examination. Not the examination of the PhD students and the MA students and the BA students and the MSc students and the whatever students. Not the fivers, not the A grades and the B grades and two ones and thirds and hey, you're off. You're out. Set down. But the real test, the real test, according to the Quran, according to the, the Injil, according to the Old Testament, according to the Psalms of David, According to most of the books of knowledge that, is, that we have, and we have to accept as Muslims, in their original form, if we can find them. Yeah? We have to abide by the rules and the regulations within these books so that we, f we pass the final test. The final test, the final examination. Now this examination, it means that just in like in the, you know, when you're doing your, your dissertation and you've handed it in, there's no one around apart from you and the guy who's marking your paper. 
or the people. Sometimes it's two or three, yeah? But you hand it in, essentially that will be your test. And we believe that the cause of the severity of this test is why? So this man comes to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Bedouin, he said, when will the hour be established? So he says, what have you prepared for that hour? What have you prepared? You see, and you go to your tutor, when will the examination be, bro? <laughs> Tomorrow. <laughs> what have you prepared for it? Well, I read one book. I plagiarized three essays, so I don't really understand whether it was the truth or not. And frankly speaking, I'm a, a little worried. You know, I'm a little bit worried about going to the examination tomorrow. Now, this test is much less severe than the test that we believe all human beings, regardless of race, color, culture, creed, orientation, of color, of caste, of which football support, which team you support, is it York City or is, it, is there one called York City? <laughs> Bristol City, right, that's my team, you know, poor thing, <laughs> nearly got rele relegated this year, but you know, they, you know, all of these people will be there on that day. And they will not have anyone to intercede on their behalf. No priest, no imam, no one. No God, no one. Just one God and you. This is why we believe that we have to have persistence. We fundamentally believe it. So going back to the man, he said, I haven't put much in store, O oh, Prophet Muhammad. He said, but, he said, you know, I really love Allah. I love God. And I love you. I really love you because, you're, you know, you set an example. He said, you will get what you deserve. You will be established with the ones that you love. He tried to explain to him that just if you do this simple thing with the right intentions, the near intentions, that you will be rewarded according to those intentions. But unfortunately, <laughs> that doesn't accord with the examinations we take in York University, right? They're probably a lot more stern and a little bit more difficult. They're not going to tell you, you had good intentions, you turned up, and we're going to give you an A grade? No. Nope. <laughs> we're going to give you a 2-1? No. Nope. We give you a fast? No. Nope. We give you a slap and you're out of here, boy. <laughs> you know. So, why do we, therefore, you know, because both are important, right? You have, to, you have to do well in this university, brothers and sisters, yeah? In humanity and, you know, some of your teachers are probably over here, so you better put a nice smile on afterward, yeah? But, you know, essentially, we need to have that balance, and this is what a good Muslim is all about. You know, make sure that you turn up at your vibers, you turn up at your, at your seminars and your lectures and learn your stuff, because that's what you need to do when it comes to the final test as well. You know, so both are very important. Now, you know, uh, <clears throat> the, you know, people will think, well, so why did God create us to suffer? You know, I mean, why? And it's something I ask myself sometimes. Well, because I didn't tell you about the other good bit. That's why. The good bit is, first of all, how long is this world for? What's the average uh, life expectancy of a male in Britain today? And that, that's in Britain, right? Other places, much less. What is it? 76. 60 to 70, right? Yes, yeah, 60, uh, 67. 76. 76. You sure it's that much? Yeah, I don't think it's that much, is it? You sure? Maybe not. Female is more, isn't it? Males only like they, they, you know, because they. <laughs> Let's not get into that, right? <laughs> Males don't know. They, 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 they have a, a less, less uh, years here, don't they? Generally speaking, right? Anyway, so 
here we are in this world with our 60 to 70 years and the Prophet Muhammad actually said the people of this Ummah and everyone in the world alive today is of this Ummah according to Muslims, this is what they think, this is what they believe the people of this Ummah, Ummah means nation okay, Um comes from where? the Um, Ummi, Mother comes from the Mother the nation of Islam comes from the Mother okay so the Mother is very important in Islam but without that you don't have a nation you won't even have the word nation but the essential thing is that when you know you've got this nation who's between and the Prophet Muhammad says and mentions between 60 and 70 years of age yeah, he says you will be aged between 60 and 70 he said that 1400 years ago in the, in the desert a literate man by the way yeah so he knew the people of this age would be between 60 and 70 and what I want to ask you is would you if I were to tell you just suspend reality for the minute yeah if I was to tell you that would you have 60 or 70 years in this world that you definitely know about or if I exchange that for an eternity in a place where you never die you don't get old you don't defecate, you don't argue, you don't fight, there's no wars, there's no people bombing from 30,000 foot in the air just in case, you know. If I was to tell you that there was such a place and it was a reality, would you exchange the 60 years you know about for that? Would you? It's a question because, you know, that is what Islam offers. That is what <coughs> Islam or the books of God offer to mankind. I don't want to say, you see, Islam and Muslims, when you use those terms, it confuses the issue, you see. Reality is that Jesus, peace be upon him, we believe him to be a great prophet. We're the only non-Christian faith to believe that he was a great man and a great prophet, and he existed even. Some people say he didn't even exist. We accept him as a prophet and a great man and a great role model. And we, we say that, indeed, uh, this man is a great guide to a whole nation of people just like the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings uh, upon him is. Okay? So, if I was to tell you that I will give you in exchange, and this is what the Quran mentions, the, an eternity, everything forever, would you not be interested? Don't put your hands up if you've been interested. You wouldn't be interested, right? So you don't, you don't like eternity? Wow. Are you sure? No, I mean, just suspend reality for a minute. Just, just put your hands up. Who, want, who would like an, an eternity? Okay. But well, I mean, obviously you're conscientious, conscientious objectors or something. But I mean, I, I can't believe that you just haven't put your hands up. Well, I'm not telling you that, you know, I can tell you how to get it. If, if you want. But, you know, I'm just saying that if that was an option, you would. No one in their right mind would say no. No one in their right mind would say no. But yet, that is what Allah has promised in the Quran, the last testament to mankind. He said, all you have to do is accept that there's only one God worthy of worship. First of all, we have to accept that the world was not, uh, it wasn't here, and then it was created. So we accept that the world <coughs> wasn't here one day, and suddenly there was a big bang, and it was created. And whatever Whoever put that first initial substance to create that Big Bang, that is the Creator. You see, so we have to accept that that Creator is not like His creation. His creation is very limited. It hasn't got the capacity to create anything of its own. It cannot create something from nothing. So we start with this basic premise. And that if we accept this, for example, would any of you say that this just appears out of nowhere? 
This just arrived. I'm telling you, this appeared out of nowhere. No, it did. Look, it wasn't there a minute ago. It's in my hand now. Nobody in their right mind would agree with the basic premise that this appeared out of nothing. Okay? So, there has to have been something there in order for all of this to, these proceedings to be going on right now today. Okay? Okay, so that the first thing is, basic premise, and as much as you want to argue from quantum physics and this and that and all this funky stuff, a vacuum is something. Even one molecule, if it was there, someone put that molecule there. Someone put the atom there. Someone put the element there. You see? So fundamentally, we all got to come off on that thing, and this is what the Quran says. <coughs> that do you think that you were created for mere play and amusement? Do you think that this existence is just all for nothing? You become food for worms? This is what my mother said to me. You know, I'm, I'm always having arguments with, not arguments. Hi, Mom, how you doing? You know, <laughs> give me a slap. Or I do. But, you know, you know she, she's constantly telling me, you know, I don't, I'll just get eaten by the worms. They actually burn me because I don't want to be eaten by the worms. I say, what's the difference between burning and worm eating? I'm, I prefer the worms. You know, I said, really, Mom, come on. No, she's, she's getting to the point where she accepts there must be a creator of all of that because that didn't arrive on its own, okay? If we accept that, we accept that God is God and He's completely unique, He's on His own and He doesn't have partners, He doesn't have anyone like a human, he doesn't have a son, he doesn't have a father, he doesn't have daughters, he doesn't have a pet dog, he's just, not, he's just in His own paradigm and we are on our own paradigm. This is Islam. I'm explaining this now to you. Yeah? Okay? Just you think I, I'm, I'm you know, preaching you. <laughs> well, I am actually. <laughs> I gotta tell you the truth. <laughs> but the reality is that all of this, right? If it's true and there's only one God worthy of worship, and that's the first part of the Shahada of Islam, there's Ashad, I testify. And La ilaha illallah. I just but there's only one God worthy of worship. And Muhammad is the last messenger. So what I say is the first bit, most of the people, and you know, I remember, you know, Muhammad Ali has got a very good uh, talk he gave in, 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 in America. He's a Muslim, obviously, yeah? So he, he, he gave a talk and he was saying the same thing about, you know, there's only one God. He said, look, put your hands up. In the, in the audience then, most of the people had their hands up. Most of the people, and what's changed? We became richer. We became less dependent upon a creator. Right? And now all the stats, if you look at some of the new statistics, I've just read one the other day, saying that the most impoverished countries are the ones who have more adherence to religion. They're more believing, they have more believers. And these countries, nominally, I'm a Christian, you know, you've heard it all before. Yeah, I believe sort of thing, uh, not really. I'm agnostic, you know. Now I'm sort of on the fence, really. Oh, well, okay, I understand. So when people have more wealth, they have less need of creating, according to these statistics that I've read, and this is the conclusion that was drawn. And this is in history as well. Who is Pharaoh? Who is the Pharaoh? The Pharaoh, he said, I don't, I'm not in need of a God, and he even called himself a God. He called himself a God. And the prophets used to come, and they used to, you know, have to fight the, you know, these guys. Because they, you know, they call themselves God. So we, we, you know, all of this, all of this history demonstrates to us that fundamentally there is this <coughs> good and evil battle going on all the time. And right now, the shaitan or the devil or the enemies of God are winning. The enemies of God, whether you're Christian, Jew, atheist, 
enemies of God, whoever they are, they are winning the battle against the believers. Because we don't have the ability to impart our knowledge. So there's one God worthy of worship. The one that we will call when we're on the ship and it's in distress. No doubt when you're on your own, you're sitting in your own, on your own, and your heart starts to fluctuate. Does that ever happen to you guys? Your heart starts to fluctuate. You think, oh no, oh God, oh God, please help. Um, you don't call to your mother. You don't call to your mother at that stage. You don't call to your father. You don't call to your soothsayers. You don't call, you don't go on shake Google and ask him, what happens when my heart starts to, can I, forget it, it's all finished. You go back to your fitra and you call to God. And in this country, we used to have language which was included God. We used to talk about God be with you. Now my grandmother used to say, she was an atheist. <laughs> she believed you, you know, she was going to, you know, but she used to say it. God bless. God be with you. And, uh, you know, if you go to any Spanish person, any Spanish in the room? Spanish, Hispanic, you know, adios to God. You know, all of these expressions didn't come out of nowhere. So, there's one God with your worship. And then, what happens after that? One God, because He's completely unique, He sends books of instructions because He doesn't want to leave us without instructions because that wouldn't be a merciful God. He's got to send books of instruction. So we have the Injil, the, the Gospels. We have the Thamud. We've got the Old Testament and the New Testament. We've got the Psalms of David. We've got all of these books that in the original form, I fundamentally believe were sent by God. And the last testament to mankind, I believe, and I have compelling reasons to believe this. The last testament is the Quran. It's in the British Museum, the Tokapi Museum in Turkey. You will find some of the original manuscripts of the Quran of between 20 to 30 years old. Okay? And these books, if you compare them with an Arab to the, any book that is here called the Quran in Arabic, you'll find there's no difference at all. 1400 years this book has lasted, 1400 years plus. And that we have in it scientific miracles, we have historical miracles, we have linguistic miracles. Indeed, any book that is lasted for that amount of time without it being contested, reviewed, rewritten, edited, is a miracle in itself. I challenge anyone to come up with any other book that is lasted in history as the Quran has. Okay? So that we consider, just like, you know, when I bought this, you see, poor thing, you know, this thing, Steve Jobs, did a good job. You know, he gave me this technology, and along with it came an instruction book. But if there hadn't been an instruction book, and if I didn't know the experience of vast waves of people out there who had one of these, I would have been in a lot of trouble, right? So what about the human body? What about the human mind? What about our own existence here? Forget about the existence of the iPhone. It's I, me. What happens? Where am I? I used to wake up. This is just something anecdotal for you guys. You might say, what the hell is this guy talking about? Let's get out of here, right? Fair enough. But I used to wake up every day in Britain. Brighton, you know, Brighton, I was living in Brighton. Right? And I used to look out this, and look out uh, the window. I used to close the window because I said it ain't worth it. If I don't know what this journey is about, I don't want to continue the journey I didn't have, didn't have the courage to end it all. Didn't have the courage to end it all. See? 
So when I came with this book, this book gave me good reasons to believe. It's on here, right? You know, Quran search, I think it's called, yeah? That's why I'm pointing at it. Because that's what I use to read the Quran every day, you know? We don't pick up with these big, that's fantastic. Gee, Jobs, you did a great job. <laughs> you know, so a fundamentally, if we have this belief in this one God and that, that God has given us this book of instruction, all we need now is a guy that can explain and, 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 and show us a path. This is me thinking, right? Wow. This guy, he stands on the sermon on, on, the, on, on Mount Sufa. And he calls the people and he reveals to the people that none of you will believe. I mean, most of you, you are not going to believe this. Because then he knew that they wouldn't believe him. And then the Quran reveals, Allah reveals through the angel Gabriel. On the same day, he reveals a verse. And one of the guys is standing there. The first thing he does when he hears what Prophet Muhammad says, he says, Verily. Verily, you are cursed, Muhammad, and your family is cursed. Abu Lahab. His name is Abu Lahab. The very same day the Quran, the verse is revealed, Abu Lahab, he will be in Jahannam, in, in hell. He will never believe. He will never say that he believes what you're saying is true, that there's one God. Now, the pagan Arabs had 360 idols. They had good reasons to disbelief because they were controlling the, the pilgrims. They had trade routes coming in and they had allegiances with one another which made them very powerful and very rich so they didn't believe. So Abu Lahab was one of these people. And he says straight away and then the verse of the Quran is revealed, you'll never believe Abu Lahab. You know what he did? He could have on that day destroyed the message of Islam. Could have. Why didn't he just say, Muhammad, I believe you're a prophet. There's only one God worthy of worship. And the whole of Islam would have been washed away. He hated that man the day he died. For ten years, the verse existed with the prophet Muhammad. And he did nothing about it. It could not. His tongue was tied. Why? And why would a, a prophet who was a soothsayer or a madman or a deluded liar, give the ability for his enemy, for the enemy who was standing, or somebody standing in front of him, to destroy his religion, to destroy the message he was giving. No. Because it proves that he wasn't a madman. He wasn't deluded. And the last thing I want to tell you about this man is that, you know when you have a boy in Arabian culture at that time, they would be burying their unwanted children alive who were female. The female, amongst you, all of you, imagine. Your father goes out with your sister and buries her alive. This is what they were doing before the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam came. Arabian culture was awash with disgraceful things. They would fight for ten years over somebody calling somebody a name. Now we just do that when the football's around, you know. But anyway, the reality is that this society, this society was so evil and in iniquitous when the Prophet came, he saved the women. He took the slaves out of slavery. He made the children something special. He looked after the children, he looked after his wives, he looked after society. And this is why the first three, four hundred people that accept Islam in the Arabian Peninsula there were women and slaves. There were women and there were slaves. He really took the people because he loved them. He cared about them. He used to cry in the cave of Hira, Oh Allah, save me and help me to save the others. This is a man that was sent amongst mankind and Jesus wasn't born in Rotherham. He was not born in Rotherham. Jesus was not born in Rotherham. He was from the same area as the Prophet Muhammad So believe, if you can believe the Bible, you can believe the Quran. If you believe the Bible is sent from God, you can believe the Quran was 600 years later. 
So, when I got the Quran in my hand, I opened the curtains. I opened the curtains. I looked out in the world. I see, I like these people. You know, people used to come to me before Islam. They say, "Hi, Tim." Name's Tim, by the way. <laughs> Hi, Tim. I say, get out of here, you lazy git. Ow! I don't want to know you. I used to be. I used to hate people. I used to hate life. I used to hate whatever put me here, because I didn't know. So we have something in the message that I took and I just wanted to share with you tonight. <coughs> to give you some insight to what changed my life and what can possibly, even you Muslims, right, change your life. Because I know Muslims, a lot of them, they don't know Islam at all. That's why there's such a mess out there now. So you've got these 2,000 masajid, yeah? Some of them, they don't even let women inside. They said it was mukru, yani. not a gaud, yachin. Rubbish. Why did the Prophet Muhammad allow women in the masjid? Why did he allow them in the mosques? Why did he allow the Christians to pray? And Abyssinian Christians, they came and they prayed in the mosque. Why did he allow spear throwing, you know, for ornamental purposes, guys, spear throwing in the mosque? Why did he allow women to laugh and joke in the mosque? A woman actually was known to have dragged him by his arm in the mosque, a slave woman. We Muslims don't have Islam. We lost. And the verse of the Quran, Allah By time, Allah swears that most of mankind is in a state of loss. Illa except those who have faith. Illa what you know, except those who have an attachment to God and perform the righteous deeds and recommend others to be good and to be patient. And essentially, this is Islam. It's about us loving for others, being community, speaking people the truth. Even if it's against cool or cold and sadida, speak a truthful word even if it's against yourself. But surely when you have the final test, you have the final showdown, when you're naked, <coughs> uncircumcised, in front of your Lord, then you have the answers. You have the answers. This is what makes me live. Rightly or wrongly, this is what makes me tick now. And every single day I'm alive in Britain. And I see the message of Islam is not being passed to my brothers and sisters in Britain, in England, is another day that passes as a disaster for mankind. This is the reality. This is, this, is, this is what is in my heart. This is what I believe. But of course you can assent and dissent from what I'm saying. But I advise you, as you will no doubt advise me, with other things, in other ways, to first of all, if you're a Muslim, Invite your brothers and sisters in humanity for a nice meal. Pokora. Samosa. You know? Invite them for a tea. Bring them on down. And just speak from your heart. What goes from the heart, what leaves from the heart, goes to the heart. What goes from the tongue, goes to the ear, in one ear, out the other. That's when you got a really good lecturer in the university. You got some really good ones, right? Don't say no. It's being recorded. So, 
You know, you've got really good lecturers and they speak from the heart, right? Even if it's just something about an atom. But when they speak, you remember it. Right? So Muslims, if you call yourself Mu Islam, Mu to do Islam, to impart Islam as well, please, for the sake of God, for the sake of yourself on that final day, the day of reckoning, when when children's hair will turn grey, when pregnant women will drop their load involuntarily because of what they didn't do, because of their ignorance in this world. I advise you, I advise you all to consider Islam as an option, not as another challenge or a problem to Western society. But right now, Western society is about to collapse. It's, let's be honest. You know, the economic downturn ain't just another downturn as far as I'm concerned. We've got countries going into debt. So, right on our doorstep. And we can't collectively save one country. There's my poor old, poor old country island over there. And Greece and Spain. People are not being paid three months, six months. People, it's an economic downturn. You're joking. You know why this has happened? Speak and look at the, the verses in the Bible. Look at the verses in the Bible when it comes to usury. The money in your pocket doesn't have any intrinsic value. You know, the, the money in your pocket is paper. It, the, the coins don't have any intrinsic value. They don't add anything to your wealth. If, if the bank collapses tomorrow, you've got nothing. I would advise you to trade in gold and silver from now on, by the way. <laughs> Go back to the gold and silver. You see the dirham, the gold dirham, at the time of the Prophet used to buy a sheep, and the gold dirham today will buy a sheep. Zero inflation. Okay? Go back to gold and silver and commodities. Trade in commodities, not whatever they are. <coughs> what is it, the pieces of paper or the internet, email, right? Yeah, I just traded 50,000, yeah. What? Pieces of paper? It's not real. But this is what the verses of the Quran and the Bible, they spoke against the, doing these things. It's called usury, it's called riba. Riba in, in, in uh, Islamic understanding. We should try to do away with interest as much as we can if we want to have better trading with each other. If we want to love each other, we should not trade and make the poor countries poor and the rich countries richer. We don't, you know, we know for a fact that the World Bank and the IMF are in it. I studied politics and third world development in quite a high level. I'm telling you, they're just as bad. They actually enslave nations. Enslave the nations. They give them, give them the money and then they take the interest. And they never end up paying the loan back. They're enslaved. It's gullum. It's oppression. So we have a problem in society. We need a third option. I believe, it's not my belief, it's it prophesies that Islam will come and it will make things better again. It might not be in your generation or my generation. It might not be in your kids' generation, but it's going to happen. I firmly believe it. And if it makes Britain a better place, it makes the world a better place, that's good. Sure. So I hope that I've, um, I've given advice to myself to start with, because this advice was firstly to me. And I hope that we can work together as one community, pulling together as one human community to try and improve the lifestyle and the lot of all the people in the world and we don't want to create oppression of any nations or any people or any people within that group of uh, nations. And we ask Almighty God to guide our hearts to a better way which would help us have success in this world and an eternity of pleasure and peace in the hereafter. Amen. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته